Thank you. Please, please have a seat. God is so good, isn't he? Yes, sir. You know, New Bedford was always known as the city of light, right, for the whale oil, lit the whole world. And we want to see New Bedford be the city of light again for Jesus, don't we? Come on now. Well, it's great to be here with you, church. I want to thank Marco for the invitation. You know, when this happened to me, there were really three places I, I thought of sharing the journey. One was naturally at my home church, and the other one was with Teen Challenge. I'm a Teen Challenge guy. I was able to share there with all the centers. That's right. They had a, a gathering I shared with all the centers, New Jersey, New York, and it was great. And then I wanted to share here with you guys. Because like Marco said, we are one church and so many of you have prayed for me and reached out to my family. And I can't tell you what that's meant to all of us because we're going to go through stuff. And the enemy wants us to go through it alone. But we're one body and so we're stronger together. And so I just want to tell you that I'm grateful to, hear, to be here, to share this opportunity, and to encourage you that God is the hero of my story. And that God wants to be the hero of your story. See, the goal of preaching and the goal of our testimonies is not to highlight everything that we did. It's to highlight everything that he did, right? One of my favorite scriptures is John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. And he says this, verse 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not recorded in this book. In other words, Jesus, his whole life, his whole ministry was filled with miracles, was filled with signs and wonders, was filled with tales of his love and his kindness. But these, he says in verse 31, are written, and listen to this, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing you may have life in his name. That you don't, you don't just come to know who Jesus is, but through that acknowledgement you come to have life. Life in his name. That's why we preach that you would experience transformation through Christ that you would take him up on his offer of new life. So I want to tell you a little bit of my story, but I want to begin by reading a scripture because our lives shouldn't inform how we read the scripture, but the scripture should inform how we live our lives. The scriptures make clear to us who God is. The Bible is written and Jesus came so we could see the character and the heart of God. It's one thing to have information. It's another thing to be in a situation where everything you've ever learned, everything you know in your head is about to be tested in your heart. See, I could have thought of Genesis 50, 20, you know, the plans I have, I mean, uh, you know, what, what you meant to harm me, the Lord meant for good, right? I could have used that, Genesis 50, 20. I could have thought of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He will make your path straight. I thought of those scriptures. I, I, I thought of John 15, you know, abide in him. Abide in him and you'll bear much fruit. All these scriptures were in my heart. All these scriptures were on my mind. See, you read scriptures not just so you memorize them, not just so you, you can bring that Bible trivia or you get the Bible category in jeopardy, but so when you go through stuff, it's in your heart and it comes up. And of course, I thought of Romans 8, 28, right? Everybody thinks of that. But then I really started to think. And to me, the scripture that I held on to is Romans 8.32. I want to read this section of scripture, and now I'll tell the story. But I want the story to be told in light of this, okay? And so I'm going to read it. I just want to give you a one takeaway sentence. If, if you want a one takeaway sentence. Trials are God's grace in your life. Just think of that before I read this. Trials are God's grace in your life. Okay, I'm going to read Romans 8. I'm going to read verses 31 through 39. 
Now, this is to put this in context. Paul's going to make these statements. He's going to ask rhetorical questions. It's a very powerful way to teach, okay? So now Paul's going to put it in context. Because we know Romans 8, 28, God works all things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose, right? And now our text, this is after Paul talks about living in the Spirit. This is after Paul talks about us being heirs with Christ. This is after Paul talks about having our hearts set on eternity by considering our earthly situation temporary, which he'll preach, right? In other words, have an eternal perspective. After he tells us these things, then he's going to say this. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And here, right here, is Romans 8, 32. And when I was laying in a hostel bed, completely paralyzed, pondering the goodness of God. If there were any question in my mind or in my heart whether God was good, this scripture immediately came to mind. He, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If the, see, I understand when the world thinks that Christianity, Christians are limited or somehow God doesn't want what's best for us or somehow Jesus stands and says the enemy comes to kill and steal and kill and destroy. And I come that you may have life and have it to the full. And I think we don't believe him. Somehow, somehow the enemy has convinced the church that God doesn't want what's best for us. All you have to do is look at the cross. All I had to do is think, wait a minute, I know God loves me. Look at the cross. Paul continues, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who's to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Do we realize that, church, that right now, Jesus is interceding on our behalf? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? It is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. He's quoting the Psalms. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life no angels, no rulers, no things present, no things to come, no powers, no heights, no depth, no anything else of all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. <laughs> nothing. There is nothing that you've gone through, that you're going through, or that you will go through that will separate you from the love of God. Do you believe that? See, the the good thing about suffering is it creates a humility and dependence. And with humility and dependence focused on Christ, that creates intimacy. Sadly, and I've been a pastor for a long time, I've been walking with Jesus, it it took me laying paralyzed in a hostel bed for four months to pray like I've never prayed in my life, and I'll talk about it. But when you say nothing can separate you from the love of God, that's one thing to say. And incidentally, the way God works is I was in school, I was halfway through my doctorate, and I was doing work, and I was reading a book. I'm doing my doctorate in apologetics, which is a defense of the Christian faith. And the biggest objection is always suffering. There's a pastor who said once, if you ask people who don't believe in God, the number one reason they don't believe in God, they'll tell you suffering. If you ask people who believe in God when their faith grew the most, they'll tell you suffering. And so I had to, in the middle of this ordeal, ask myself the question, who is God? And I was reading this book by a Korean medical doctor turned theologian whose father had been a Christian and suffered his whole life. And he was sharing about how his dad, despite his circumstances, had the strongest faith he'd ever seen. And I remember reading it and thinking like, that's amazing. You know, I I don't know if I could do that, right? I mean, that's what we do. 
And then now here I was, and I'm, I'm paralyzed in a hospital bed, and I'm thinking, well, we're going to test this out, aren't we? And I'm here to tell you that God is so good. So it's a little difficult to talk about this, but it's helpful. I'm among friends, right? And I, and I talk about it to share the journey to encourage you that God is good. But on November 19th, so yesterday it was 11 months to the day, uh, after about two weeks of the respiratory infection, I was in and out of the doctors and finally went to the emergency room. They had sent me the day before back. And, and so I, I went there. I was having uh, symptoms. My fingertips were numb. My face started to droop. And uh, they tested me for a uh, stroke. And then they said I wasn't having a stroke and they were going to send me home. And so I paused to say this. You know your body. Advocate for yourself, and you'll see in the story why. But speak up. If something's not right, speak up, you know. The doctors are experts, but they're busy. They got stuff. Sometimes they, so speak up. So they were going to send me home, and at this time, I, could, I started to lose movement on my left arm. And so I, they had called my wife for everything. And so I said to the doctors, look, something's wrong with you. You can't send me home. And they said, well, we can send you by ambulance. You can go to Boston or Rhode Island, but there's nothing else we can do for you here. So I chose Rhode Island. They put me in an ambulance, and they sent me to Rhode Island Hospital. I got there, and within eight minutes, I was in a room with two doctors. And uh, the doctors looked at me, and uh, by this time, um, I had a, a, a straw that was taking all the saliva out of my mouth because I was drowning on my own saliva. I couldn't swallow. My throat had collapsed. And so the doctor said, look, we have to intubate you because you're not going to make it if we don't. And they, there were two doctors in Rome, and, and they said, uh, if your heart stops, do you want us to resuscitate your heart? Because there was nobody to sign anything. And I said, let's put that on the list. Let's make that number one on the to-do list. <laughs> I'm, I'm in full agreement. Let's, yeah, let's, let's keep the heart going, right? So... So everybody agreed there that was the plan, and then they said, well, you know, we have to do this. And so now I said, you know, give me a minute, and I prayed what I thought might be my last prayer on earth. And what I prayed was, God, I'm 50 years old, and I don't want to die. I have a family. I have a ministry. But if this is it, and I don't open my eyes, on earth again. I want to express to you nothing but gratitude for the greatest life anyone's ever had, for salvation, for a church family, for a wife and family. I said, Lord, I am grateful and I thank you for this life you've given me. And then I told them to go. And I wanted my last prayer on earth to be one of gratitude, and I woke up. And so waking up, that was good, but I woke up, and I was in an MRI machine, which is bad enough if you've ever been in an MRI machine. And then I realized I'm paralyzed. So I was in the MRI machine. My right eye was open. My left eye was mostly shut. I could wiggle my feet, and I was wrapped in blankets, and that was it. And so at that moment, I realized, like, if I freak out right now, I might not come back. Because that's the thing everybody says, you must have been scared. I realized in that moment, if I, if I get power, if I, I might not ever come back from it. And I had the presence of mind, the Holy Spirit, to pray. And so I prayed. And... Uh, they got me, I don't think I was supposed to wake up in the MRI machine. They got me out of that. They got me back. I was settled in a room. And uh, I think within, within a few days, they told my, my wife and I had what's called Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS. It's very rare. The chances of getting it are like one in 300,000. It usually starts with your leg. I'm very special. My mother's been telling me that my whole, li whole life. <laughs> but so I got a special variant. I got like a one in a million variant that started with my hands and face. My hands and my arms are partly paralyzed and my face, which is why my speech. That will be hopefully the last thing to come back. But it's very, very rare. And so here I was with this disease. 
basically the, they call it myelin sheaths, but you have these nerve endings that allow signals to travel from your brain to your body. Those nerve endings get damaged and so the signal doesn't go. And so you're paralyzed. And so I have a, a few pictures I can, I can show you and, and kind of explain here. I think we got the first one. So that's tough to see now. You know, I look at these after, and it's still tough for me to look at, because I, I never felt as bad as I looked for, for saying whatever that's saying. But f thank God, in my spirit, in my countenance, I, I, I was always good. I mean, I had bad days, but I, I was good. I was trusting in Jesus. So I had, uh, I was on full life support. I had two uh, lines helping me breathe. I had six lines coming out of my carotid artery where they gave me medication, where they took blood. Um, and then I had a, a feeding tube. We can go to the next picture. So that's my wife, my daughter. Uh, I was in the hospital for about six months total. There wasn't a single day that my wife wasn't with me for eight hours or more, not a single day. And, and the way God does things, because we know how God is, my daughter, who's right there, had graduated from school early. She was going for speech, uh, speech pathology, to be a speech pathologist to help people with speech. So you can go to the next picture. I told you I was trying out. So I have ice on my head. This was in November. Your senses get all, all messed up. So they had a fan on me, and they every day, ice on, on me every day, because I was burning up. But we can go to the next picture. So the way I could communicate, so my daughter quickly realized I could move my foot. So I went from just looking at people and they would ask you questions to be able to go. If my foot was up and down, that was yes. If it was side to side, that was no. So that was revolutionary. When you can't communicate at all, suddenly when you can say yes or no, that's a thing. Then my, right? The key to everything is gratitude. The key to everything. At every moment, you can find something to be grateful for, right? So my daughter devised this thing. She would pick a row. If I hit the right row, I'd move my foot. Then she'd pick a letter on that row, I'd move my foot again. Eventually, we got free good. It was like a little show on the road, right? <laughs> and that was the first thing I spelled out. I said, show this to the church. It says, I'm closer to Jesus than I've ever been. The other thing I... The other thing I said, which is on the side, which is a little funny, is I said, I'm mentally sharp because my mother, everybody talks to me, like, are you okay? You know, like, I'm here, I can understand, you know, I'm, I'm with you. So the next step, we can go to the next picture. So that was, uh, I had, um, so what they said was, uh, I was on, I was intubated for uh, 12 days. You can only be intubated for two weeks. You know, it causes a lot of issues. They want to take you off the ventilator. So they said, well, our plan is that we can do a trach and a feeding tube. And I said, all right, well, you know, is there a plan B? And they said, well, no. I said, all right, well, again, let's go to plan A then, right? And so, th yeah, that, so that was, they, they put a trach and a feeding tube, and they said, uh, and again, it was somewhat encouraging, hopefully they'll get to be removed someday. So uh, I didn't know at the time. Um, I actually woke up in the middle of that surgery. I was laying there, and, uh, and all of a sudden I woke up, and the doctor said, you're okay, you were crashing, we had to bring you out of anesthesia, but we're just finishing up. It's like, well, that's good news, right? Yeah, you've got to keep a sense of humor about this stuff, right? <laughs> what are you going to do? So I was in survival mode in the beginning. You know, I'm trying to be strong. The days are filled with activity, nurses and doctors, I'm trying to be strong my wife and daughter, you know? And then they would have to go, and I didn't want them to leave, but I didn't want them to know how bad I didn't want them to leave. When I say, you know, if I was stuck and my head was one way, it was gonna be that way for eight hours until somebody came in. Paralyzed was paralyzed. So when they left, there was a, there was a, that anxiety, that crippling fear. And as I mentioned before, in that moment, I said to God, look, I have no chance of getting through any of this. You just, I mean, let me, let me die now, or I need to be overwhelmed by your presence. Now, like I said, I've been, I've been in ministry for 25 years. I love Jesus. I walked through recovery. I've lost my dad. I've been through some stuff, but I have never prayed. Sadly, I confess to you, I've never prayed. 
like I did in that moment. And the first thing I did was I began to think about Jesus. And I began to picture in my brain, in my mind, stories of Jesus. I, I would picture him washing the disciples' feet. I would picture him just sitting and talking to the disciples. And I would, I would begin to just say words like, Messiah, Savior, Lord, Jesus. And I would meditate on what each of those words meant. What does that mean that he's my Savior? What does that mean that he's my Lord? What does that mean that he's my King? And after I would spend some time just focusing on who Jesus was, I would say this, Lord Jesus, pour out your mercy on me. And I get lost. Maybe an hour would go by. Lord Jesus, pour out your grace on me. Lord Jesus, pour out your healing on me. Lord Jesus, pour out your presence on me. The answer to every prayer you've ever prayed and every prayer you ever will pray is more Jesus. Do you know that? Do you know that's why in our struggle we have a unique opportunity? Because when you're really struggling, you're not worried about what anyone else is thinking about you. You're not worried about the superficial stuff. Suffering has a way of putting things in perspective to make everything real. And Jesus is there. He's been there all along. I think it was D.L. Moody that said, we can stand affliction better than prosperity because in prosperity we forget God. See, in affliction, we're well aware of our need for him. I was saying earlier, and I say it here, that if the choice was to fully heal and not be spiritually where I am now, or, or to continue with this illness in the closeness I have with Jesus, I would take this illness all day long. <laughs> See, I knew that God was going to do something in the middle of this. I knew it, but right there, what I needed in my prayer was his reassurance. I didn't need a theological explanation for, for why God was allowing suffering. I needed to tell him, I love you, and I'm here with you, and I'm not going to leave you. And he did. And I want to stop and say that if you're here, that's what you need as well. See, God will use our circumstance to bring attention to our condition. But God didn't come just to change your circumstance. He came to change your condition. He is more concerned with each of us growing to the character of Jesus than being comfortable. And I tell people all the time, the problem with the American dream is comfort is the opposite of growth. And Jesus didn't say live comfortable. He said live like me. And yet the ironic thing is the most comfortable way to live as a human being is conformed to Jesus Christ. And so I cried out to God and I prayed. I focused on who I knew him to be from the scriptures and I asked him for what I needed. The other day I was uh, with my wife. I was at the therapist. I still do a lot of uh, outpatient uh, therapy. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I spent six months in, uh, in three hospitals um, I have to learn, or I've had to relearn almost everything. Um, I, I completed my physical therapy. I, uh, I completed most of my street therapy. I'm still doing occupational therapy, which is my hands and arms. The, it comes back the, way, the opposite of the way I lost it. So I lost it in my fingertips and my face. It went down to my legs. I began to recover it through my legs, and it should come back, and that would be the last thing, hopefully. <laughs> But I was, at the, I was at the therapy, and I, and I told my wife, I said, text this, because I'm always, I got to write stuff down. I said, text this. Slow progress is still progress. <laughs> Slow progress is still progress. Somebody needs to hear that today. See, I have a long way to go. There's a lot of things I can't do, but instead I tend to focus on the things I can do. I tend to focus on being grateful. I tend to focus on how good God is. I think we have a couple more pictures we'll get through quick. And uh, so after four months of being inside, I, I didn't leave. I mean, that was like the worst. 
I couldn't go outside. I watched through the window. They brought me outside and they surprised me with my dog. I cried like a baby, but that's, that's me and my dog. And uh, ne next picture. And they let me bring my dog in the hospital, which is great. So I was heading out. Look, I know you are struggling. I know people are here and they're going through stuff. And it doesn't matter if our struggles look different because our God looks the same. And I pray, not that you just be encouraged by a guy who went through some stuff, but you be encouraged by the good God who wants to take every single one of us through our stuff. People talk about how strong I am, and I'm not strong. I'm afraid. I'm anxious. I'm often short-tempered. There's a lot of days I cry. But if there's anything you see good about the way I'm dealing with this struggle, it's God's grace in my life. I'm surrounded by amazing family and friends and church. And eventually, as you can see, the trach and the feeding tube are both in re removed. I was able to stand and sit and then walk again. On May 10th, after spending six months in three hospitals, I was finally discharged home. I think we got uh, another picture. That was the day I walked out of the hospital. I have to work every single day to get better. And I'll look at something and I'll realize, all right, you can't do that. But Immediately, what I'll say to myself is, well, you can't do that yet, first of all, and let's see how close you can come. I'm like a little kid. Every time I do something for the first time, I tell him, take a picture, look at it. I opened the... I got the mail by myself. I couldn't open the mailbox forever. There's a lot of things I have to depend on other people to do, and I don't like that. But you know what? It teaches me patience. It teaches me humility. It teaches me dependence. It helps me to recognize how much we need one another. Every single person in this room is going through something, and God is there. He's inviting you to trust him. Let God fight your battles, but do your part. Stand firm. When bad things happen, you can go through them or you can grow through them. Press in. Jesus is there. I promise you, as sure as I'm standing there, there's an intimacy with him that is beyond everything, anything that you could imagine. Struggle will create humility if we let it. You know, my, my heart, and I love that David says this, taste and see that the Lord is good. If there's, one, if there's a one-word phrase of, of my life in ministry, I want it to be that. Because we tend to read the Bible, we tend to look at other people's testimonies, and we think that's for them. We never experience it. And my heart is that you for yourself would taste and see how good God is. We got another picture. Last weekend, I was able to not only walk my daughter down the aisle, But to perform the ceremony and to dance with her in my whole life, this will be the last thing I'll leave you with. My whole life, I've been petrified of airplanes, like big airplanes. I don't like to fly anywhere. And I was in that hospital bed, and I thought, you're going to die, and you're afraid to fly. If you get out of this thing, you need to get over that. Well, I get over it. We can show the last picture. But I'm taking flying lessons. And so now... And people say, I thought you were afraid to fly. I said, I'm not really afraid to die anymore. That opens up all kinds of possibilities. <laughs> but it's because my trust and faith in God have been increased. The goal of preaching is not that people would say, what a great sermon or what a great story, but that people would know what a great Savior. That God's people would be moved to action to go and be his church. And so I'll leave you with this quote by Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands and no feet on earth. 
but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ looks compassion into the world. Yours are the feet with which Christ walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which Christ blesses the world. Church, because I know the love of God, because on the cross was demonstrated for each of us the love of God, I choose every day to walk in gratitude. And that's made all the difference. I love you. Thank you for letting me share. God bless you.